before I explain, you know, why else transactional memory is good, let me first explain what transactional memory itself is. Okay, so here's what it is. So in thread one, you know, the programmer realizes that I'm entering a region of code where I'm touching shared variables. I could be touching head, tail, so on. And, you know, I want to be safe and I want to make sure that I'm the only thread that is changing these values at a time. Okay, so up front I say I'm going to begin a transaction. And then once I'm done with this, with these shared variables, I will end my transaction. And I will expect the hardware to give me the illusion of atomicity. So the behavior will be as if this thread or, you know, this thread was running entirely by itself. And there was no one else running at the same time and messing with these shared variables at the same time. Okay, so the behavior is almost as if I had acquired a lock and I was preventing all other threads from making forward progress at the same time. Okay. Similarly, you know, in thread two, again, you are entering this region where you're touching shared variables. So the programmer simply does transaction begin and transaction end. And the behavior will be as if, you know, nobody else was modifying these shared variables while I was executing. Okay. In reality, what does the hardware do? The hardware says, well, you're starting a transaction. So I'm going to start doing some bookkeeping. I'm going to record exactly what you're touching, but I'm going to let you make forward progress. Same thing over here. When you get to the transaction begin, the hardware starts doing some, it starts doing some record keeping, but it lets this thread advance into this transaction. Okay. So both of these threads are now making forward progress, even though they're possibly touching the same shared variables. This was not allowed when I was working with locks, right? I had to acquire a lock and I was making sure that only one thread was getting into this critical section at a time. But in this case, both threads are entering this at the same time. And the hardware is going to do some checks, as I said, right? So if this thread is only modifying head and this thread is only modifying tail, when you get to the transaction end, I do a check to see, you know, what all, what all did you touch? What all did this other transaction touch? If you touch different elements, then both of these threads, you know, both of these transactions get to commit at the same time. And they both commit successfully and you move on, right? So the hardware is now responsible to, to see if there was a conflict between the values touched by transaction one and transaction two. Okay, and if there's no conflict, both are allowed to proceed and uh, you get high performance because both of these transactions executed in parallel. If there was a conflict, right? So let's say that this thread got into a special case where you modified head and tail. Now you would do a check to recognize that there was a conflict. And so one of these threads, you know, let's say this transaction, this thread one was allowed to commit its transaction, whereas this thread two was forced to abort because you realized that this is not atomic behavior for either transaction. Okay, so because you know two different threads have 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 have, have both read the same values and at least one of them has modified the value, so the behavior of these two threads is not as if they were happening atomically, with no interference from other threads. Okay, so the one of these threads is going to be forced to abort. All of its activities are going to be cancelled, and you're going to um, you're going to roll back and you're going to restart this transaction from scratch. Okay, so the behavior is as if you know thread one was executing its transaction by itself, and thread two was just waiting in the wings for that first transaction to finish. And then when it executes a second time, it now succeeds because it is as if it was behaving by itself. Okay, so this is how transactional memory works. The 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 programmer introduces these coarse grained um, these coarse grained declarations saying I'm beginning a transaction here and I'm ending a transaction over here. And so the programming process is relatively easy. There's no deadlock because I'm not holding on to a resource and preventing everybody else from making forward progress, right? Both transactions were allowed to proceed at the same time. Okay, and uh, it, it, it was now the responsibility of the hardware to detect if there's a conflict. If there's no conflict, then you get high performance because both transactions execute in parallel and both commit successfully. So the performance is as if you had used fine-grained locks, but the programming complexity was as if you had used coarse-grained locks. Okay, and uh, the hardware, you know, when it detects a conflict, it's going to cancel one transaction and it's going to restart. Performance is not terrible because, you know, this is the kind of behavior you would have seen with your lock-based program as well. Okay, so it's no worse in performance compared to the baseline. Okay, and obviously there are many more details that we have to uncover, and I'll try to do some of that in the next few videos.